Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. We talk a lot about horror on this channel, but the real horror out there is how easy it is for your data to fall in the hands of disreputable people. That's why today's video is sponsored by Aura. While you're enjoying today's spooky video, data brokers, those things that go bump on the web, could already be selling your information to scanners, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, your health records, your relatives, they could all be out there. That's why I've been using Aura. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests just for me. It was simple to use and very intuitive, and I had barely gotten out of the setup process, and it was already blocking over 20 data broker requests on my behalf. Aura protects your passwords, your banking information, everything you need for day-to-day -day online life. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use my information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, other sensitive information, things like a certain YouTube channel that you all enjoy listening to so much. Aura also does much more to protect me and my family from online threats, the kind you can't see. It comes with other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It really is just that easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. I hear you saying, but Dr. Plague, I have one or two of these tools already. But, dear readers, not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Readers of my fine tales can tell you why that never ends well. Aura is always on, doing the hard work of keeping me safe so I can focus on other tasks like finishing my latest book or uploading my most recent video. I value my privacy, and I know you value yours. You can go to Aura.com, that's A-U-R-A dot com, to start your two-week free trial. You can also check out the link below and start your free trial with Aura. So why not give Aura a try and protect yourself from the real monsters out there? The worst part about insomnia is the boredom. Nothing's open except for the seedy places. Nobody awake except for the seedy people. Nothing to do except watch movies and eat sunflower seeds. Seriously, screw insomnia. My sleep capacity generally comes and goes in waves, but the few weeks before I found Howl's was especially rough. There was no inciting incident, just that general feeling of restlessness and anxiety that had become a familiar friend over the years. I tried all the standard assists, warm milk, old movies, cut down on my caffeine intake, all the usual things that people recommend, but never really work. Eventually, more out of boredom than anything, I took to taking late night walks through the city. I worked a crappy job as a projectionist at a local movie theater, and on the weekends I didn't often get off work until the last movie finished, and the city had long since wound down by that time. The first week or two, I stayed towards the well-lit areas, populated by the intoxicated, both rich and poor. But while the people watching was always good, I quickly grew tired of the restless noise and began wandering off the beaten path. I'm not sure how I'd never noticed Hal's before. I distinctly remember buying smokes at the dilapidated gas station across the street on several occasions, and I'm sure my eyes would have been drawn to the large storefront window still brightly lit and welcoming at 3 a.m. The neon sign pronounced it Hal's low-cost thrift store and consignment, glowing in garishly conflicting colors, except for the first, which was burnt out. Of course, I would come to realize that there was a very good reason I had never seen it before. But that night, I wondered if maybe I was hallucinating from sleep deprivation. I entered. Of course I did. Even if I didn't feel the need to validate that the whole thing wasn't just a figment of my imagination, there was no way I could deny my curiosity. 
It was probably the smell that I noticed first. Kind of a combination of burning sage and rancid meat, but in a weirdly good kind of way. Best thing I can compare it to is the beach bonfires at low tide. The place was packed full of merchandise, all displayed very neatly on row after row of shelves, but without any sign of clear organization. Knickknacks sat on the same shelves as old magazines and jumper cables. A bizarre collection of artwork decorated the walls from shadow boxes holding sports memorabilia to Pink Floyd posters to copies of famous Impressionist paintings. The wall furthest from the front entrance was actually just an unbroken line of doors, each door crafted into an entirely different style, and each painted a different color to create a full-length pride flag along the wall. In the center, the green door actually appeared to be an elevator, which really just raised additional questions. I began to browse the first aisle to the left of the front door. Full silver-plated dining set, a clown costume, a chainsaw without a chain, four cookbooks, a Super Soaker XP100 already filled with water, several fake antique-looking religious relics such as crosses and Buddha heads, and a full-length evening cloak that made me immediately start contemplating a career as a supervillain, if for no better reason than it would look amazing on me. I browsed several more aisles with a bemused smile on my face as the truly eclectic inventory continued to defy any clear organizational sense. That was until a gruff voice cleared its throat. I glanced up to see the shopkeeper behind the front counter staring at me. He was a medium-sized guy, but he held a clear don't-fuck-with-me aura about him. His head was shaved bald, and his arms and shoulders indicated someone who had spent more than a few years working in trades. Can I help you find something? He asked, his voice a low grumble that ran the line between professionalism and wanting to throw my ass to the curb. I shot him one of my patented disarming smiles. Not really, just kind of browsing. He continued to stare at me for a moment his eyes probing as if searching for a way to sort me into one of the Jungilian architects that all retail employees have for their customers. Incubus? he asked finally. S Excuse me? Are you an incubus? he responded, his eyes still searching mine. No, Jim and I, actually. Well, on the cusp with cancer, really. I don't think people actually use the astrology pickup line in real life. I gotta ask, do you, do you get a lot of success with that one? With nostalgia being all the rage these days, going for one of the classic pickup lines is actually a brilliant idea. The corner of the man's mouth twitched just a moment before returning to its painted on scowl. That immediately put me at ease. Couldn't work the late night shift without having that hard of a shell as an exterior, but if I could touch a sense of humor, he probably wouldn't be throwing me out anytime soon. I don't get a lot of people coming in here just to browse, he said, his voice having moved slightly away from the gravelly rumble he was using before. Less Bob Dylan and more Bob's Burgers. Most know exactly what they want by the time they lay their eyes on the place. I shrugged. What can I say? I'm an impulsive sort. Hey, how much is this? I lifted up a snow globe that held what looked like a large hospital. Good eye shopkeeper said, raising an eyebrow. That's 200 bucks. I whistled, immediately placing it carefully back on the rack. <whistles> Pricey for a paperweight. Collector's item. There are a lot of stories inside that little snow globe. You could probably get a couple of thousand for it from the right buyer, if you're fine dealing with that kind of person. I take it since you're selling it for 200, you're not fine with that corner of the shopkeeper's mouth twitched again. I could tell he was warming up to me. I'm pretty sure you're not here for that old thing anyway. What am I here for then? I'm not sure. Keep browsing. I'm sure you'll find it. I did as I was told. An antique set of writing quills, what looked like a defunct Tesla coil, a compass and a sextant, a typewriter, VCR, a few old board games I'd never heard of, and a few other raggedy children's toys, including an actual Raggedy Ann doll. 
Nothing really struck my fancy until I was flipping through a rack of clothing and came across a treasure. I delightedly snatched it up and approached the front counter, placing it in front of the shopkeeper. He raised an eyebrow at me, and I beamed a smile at him in return. I've always wanted one of these, I chortled. The shopkeeper shook his head and pressed a few buttons on the archaic register. Not Faye, then. Never met a Faye with a decent sense of humor. For the white t-shirt with I'm with stupid written on it, that'll be a buck fifty-three. I fished a handful of coins out of my pocket and counted out exact change. He took it and sorted the money into the correct slot. He looked back at me and shook his head. This has got to be the dumbest sale I've made this year. I'm not even sure why that was on the rack. Hey, I'm not complaining, I said, pulling my new purchase over my shirt. Did you just open? I walk by this area pretty often, and I'm sure I've never seen you here before. The man's smile came out fully. Yes and no. We've been in business for a long time, but I guess you could say we're new to the area. Well, I hope you stick around, Hal, I said, nodding with feigned understanding as I extended my hand. You got a bunch of weird stuff in here, and there aren't that many places for me to go shopping this time of night. Butch, the shopkeeper replied, shaking my outstretched hand. Hmm? My name's Butch, not Hal. What the hell would the owner be doing here behind the counter at 3 a.m.? I threw my head back and laughed. <laughs> I stand corrected. Butch grinned. So not an incubus, not Fay, not a vamp. The hell are you doing in my shop? He raised an eyebrow. Buying vintage clothing, apparently. No, seriously, what's your deal? You a shapeshifter? A Wendigo? Cannibal? Dude, I I've worked enough retail to know all about the normal customer archetypes, but I think you've lost me on these. Is a shapeshifter one of those shoplifters who keeps showing up in different clothes like they're actually fooling anyone? Butch looked at me in perplexity, but a little bell rang announcing the arrival of another customer before he could continue his line of questioning. We both glanced towards the door instinctually, and I suddenly also began wondering what the hell I was doing in the store. The woman who had just entered was tall, disturbingly tall, at least... That was my first impression. I soon realized, though, that she wasn't actually tall. She was just floating a solid two feet off the ground. She wore a long, pale, white, semi-translucent dress that fell clearly past her feet and dragged gently on the floor. A white veil was pinned to her unkept mane of dark hair and spread across her face. That veil did nothing to disguise the bloodshot and sorrowful eyes, the broken nose, or the mouth that hung open to the center of her chest, leaving a large black void from her cracked and broken top teeth to well past her neck. I recoiled in horror, slipping and falling directly onto my ass before scooting myself back until my back hit a rack of shelves and a hairy taxidermied hand fell onto my lap. I held it up in preparation to do battle, should I need to. The Spectre, however, paid me absolutely no mind. She merely glided down one of the aisles, raised her hand to delicately select something off a shelf, and then floated back up to Butch's counter. Evening, Maeve. Just the usual, Butch asked casually. The woman's cavernous mouth seemed to open wider, and a reverberating moan began to vibrate my soul. It wasn't loud, but it suddenly reminded me of the sound I heard my mother make over my grandfather's deathbed when I was nine years old. All right, gorgeous. It's 450. The woman in white reached out a hand limply and dropped a handful of crumpled bills on the counter. She then turned and slowly guided out of the door. My shaking hands continued to point the furry limb at her, long past the point she was out of sight. Throat lozenges, stated Butch. I swept the arm to point at him, my heart still racing as my eyes went wide. Butch seemed unconcerned. Maeve comes in every night for a pack. Her work leaves her throat pretty sore. I'm not sure if they do much, but it's always the regulars who keep a business afloat. That, that, that was a freaking banshee, I almost screamed. Butch's eyebrows raised as though impressed. 
Wow, I'm impressed. Most humans wouldn't recognize one on sight. Hey, could you stop pointing that thing at me? They can get a little unpredictable if you're not used to them. I kept my impromptu weapon trained on him for another moment before allowing my hand, still tightly clenched, to fall into my lap. I continued to breathe shakily for another moment and then tried to get my head straight. I I'm sorry, I said once I felt I could speak without screaming. That was really not something I expected to see tonight. What the f what the heck, Butch? Banshees are banshees are real? And they come in here every night for for what? Laryngitis treatment? What is this place? I realized my voice was starting to gain volume again and I stopped, swallowed and took another raspy breath. Sorry, I I never reacted well when I get scared. Believe me, I I wish that didn't happen to me, but the thing still clamped in my hand suddenly lurched. I curiously glanced down at it, only then fully recognizing what had been clenched in my fist. Is that a, that's a monkey's paw, isn't it? Yeah, you may want to put that down before you make another wish, Butch said, an amused smile on his face. W what did I say? Still scared? Of what? Oh, right, an ugly banshee chick. No, I'm good now. What? Why do my pants smell bad? Butch rolled his eyes. Go ahead and grab a new pair. No charge. Nice. C can I use your bathroom? He nodded towards the far wall of the shop. Purple door. I'd avoid opening any of the others if I were you. Spoil sport. Is that elevator real? Yes and no. I'm not answering any follow-up questions until I can't smell you anymore. Ten minutes later, I was feeling much cleaner, if slightly chilly, in my newly bought, off-the-rack stupid shirt and newly gifted booty shorts. I must have been starting to grow on Butch, because other than another twitch in his mouth and a slight shake of his head, he didn't much react to my change of style. So you're actually just a straight human, aren't you? I can't think of another species that would so flagrantly disregard their own safety. Don't watch a lot of online videos, do you? You know what I mean. Even the bloody orgy folk will show up in something tailored, at least. Butch, you had a floating girl in here wearing funeral clothes. Versace. Maeve's taste is old-fashioned, but always quality. I paused with my mouth open before stuttering slowly. All right, then. I guess I stand corrected. Should I change so I don't offend the bloody orgy folk? I finally got a full laugh out of Butch. <laughs> What's your name, kid? Clear. Sorry? Clear. Middle name is Water. My parents were hippies, also big fans of revivals. Man, I thought I drew the short straw when it came to my name, but you got me beat. So what... The shop bell rang again. Unlike the previous customer, I felt not even the slightest twinge of fear as the latest monster strolled through the building. Six and a half feet tall and covered in reddish-brown fur, the man with the overly canine face was sporting an overly cordial grin. The werewolf nodded casually at Butch and began strolling the aisles. Butch nodded back and then raised an eyebrow at me as though interested in my newfound stoicism. Well, he asked, as if unsure whether or not I was going to crap myself again. I can't believe you gave me a hard time about my booty shorts and then didn't blink at a freaking werewolf. Butch grunted in satisfaction. Guess that monkey's paw was the real deal. I should bump the price up. You didn't know? He shook his head. It's a good policy not to screw around with a monkey's paw. Had a feeling it was legit, though. A lot of the other stuff we get from that particular estate ended up being, uh, pretty extraordinary. There was a pause. Such as, I demanded. Come on, dude, you can't drop a line like that and not show off a bit. Butch laughed again and turned around to the display wall behind the counter. He pulled down a shadow box and laid it on the counter in front of me. Inside was an almost cartoonishly large revolver. Six chambers, but with a bulbous barrel that you could have fired a skeet ball out of. 
There were three huge rounds already loaded, but with no caliber that I recognized. You seem like the kind of guy who would appreciate this. He opened the case and gestured for me to pick it up. I did, immediately surprised by its apparent weightlessness. I spun it around my finger, gunslinger style, and leveled it harmlessly towards the door at the end of the hall. The werewolf glanced up at me curiously for a moment before returning to his shopping. Love the way it handles, but I don't recognize the make. One of a kind. They call it the Chekhov gun. I laughed. Seriously? I guess I should fire it then, huh? Probably, but I wouldn't waste the ammo if you don't want to. Those three rounds are all there are left. How very hackney, I said, examining one of the rounds. These things seem a little unnecessary, unless you're hunting kaiju. What are they? I've just taken to calling them MacGuffins. I've only seen it used once, during a debate over the bathrooms being only for paying customers. One thing led to another, and a full army of vampires ended up laying siege to the shop. Had to have been at least a four or five hundred of them. Hal shot off a round from this, and it fired an actual sun. Gave me a third degree burn on every exposed inch of skin. But fried every last one of those fuckers. Wait, it shoots a sun? I asked, incredulously, cautiously setting the gun back on the counter. No, shoots whatever it has to, to get the job done, Butch explained. That makes no sense whatsoever. You do realize there's a werewolf browsing through old Megadeth CDs ten feet behind you, right? turned around and locked eyes with the large hairy fellow for a moment. His tongue lolled out of the side of his mouth in a wolfish smile, and he winked at me. I mean, I get what you're saying, but I still think there's a big difference between ancient legends and relatively modern literary constructs. Butch opened his mouth to respond, but at that moment, the door slammed open with enough force to cause the lights to flicker. I glanced over my shoulder at the darkened doorway, noticing Butch's hand move to rest lightly on the Chekhov's gun on the counter. The werewolf's hackles raised, and a low growl began to rumble from his direction. The man in the doorway seemed human enough, if high-stakes lawyers could be considered human, that is. He was tall, but not intimidatingly so. His suit was well-tailored, his hair immaculate. The charming smile on his face belied the cold contempt in his eyes. Hey there, Butch, he said, his voice a purring baritone. As long time no see, Butch replied, his voice and face devoid of emotion. Way too long. The man pulled a coin from his pocket and began rolling it back and forth over his fingers. Your boss still around? You know I haven't seen Hal in months, as not since the incident with the purgatory delegation. Paychecks are still rolling in, though, so he's out there somewhere. If you find him, let him know I'm taking the fender for a Christmas bonus. As shook his head in feigned disappointment. It really would be in your best interest to help me track him down, Butch. You know the deal he made to run this place expires at the end of last month. Now my employer has a lot of respect for your old man and everything he's done over the years, so he's more than willing to renegotiate terms. Butch shook his head. You're not hearing me, as I don't know where the guy is, and I don't have any way of getting a hold of him. Come on, you really mean to tell me your boss can't suss out where he is? I'm starting to get why this little rebellion of his failed. Still not sure how he duped all of you idiots into following his lead, though. Was that like a Trump thing? As his eyes narrowed, that's low even for you, Butch. I laughed involuntarily. I don't know, man, if the MAGA hat fits. Suddenly a force slammed into me, hurtling me over the counter and against the wall behind the register. Shock shuddered through my body as a display of hooks pierced my shoulder. A flood of moisture spread down my back and I immediately started feeling a little woozy. Also, a lot pissed. I jerked my head up to glare at Az. Asshole, I just bought this shirt! I felt myself reverse directions, flying off the wall and across the store. 
I flailed painfully as I soared, managing to tip over one of the racks before colliding with the werewolf. I couldn't help but marvel at how soft he was as we hit the floor and slid into another rack, bringing its contents down on us. I always envisioned werewolf fur as being more coarse, I thought as I waited out the falling inventory. Sorry, Jack, I muttered, rolling away from the werewolf and painfully climbing to my feet. Cool if I call you Jack, I never caught your actual name. Jack growled, shaking his head like a wet dog. I don't know why you have to make me hurt your friends before you tell me what I want to know, Butch. You know how much it pains me to hurt innocent bystanders. Butch was levitating over the cash register, his limbs shaking violently as he appeared to be reflexively attempting to swallow his own tongue. I started grabbing anything within reach and throwing it at Az. I managed to score a hit with a tea kettle and an old computer mouse, but it was the lawn dart directly to the head that finally got his attention. Butch took in a raspy breath and fell to the ground as as his head spun around to glare at me. His hand shot up and I felt my windpipe close. My hands instinctively went to my neck as I tried desperately to take in air. Idiot child, rasped as, his eyes appearing a dull red as the edges of my vision began to darken. Do you have any idea who you're... I lost the rest of his sentence as Jack launched himself into Az, and the two of them flew into another rack. I fell to my knees, sucking in air and letting the world come back into focus. It sounded like Jack got one or two good swipes in with his vicious-looking claws before he flew backwards again, crashing through one of the doors at the back of the store. What lay beyond remained unknown, as the door immediately reformed behind him, pulling back into its shattered wood form until no trace of damage remained. As his head came bobbing into sight over the rack, I got back to my feet. This whole lack of fear thing was really starting to grow on me. You can force choke me all you want, Vader. We both know you're just a whiny, sand-hating little bitch. As his face was filled with fury as he raised his hand to smite me again, suddenly Butch stepped between us the Chekhov gun leveled squarely at Az's head. Az's look turned to one of contempt, but his hand still lowered slightly. How many of those bullets are you down, Butch? Two? Three? You really sure you want to waste one on little old me? What then, pray tell, will you use on the one he sends after me? Or the one after that? Eventually, the big man himself will want to come. Better hope you still have at least one left for him. My eyes fell on another gun that had fallen onto the floor in the struggle, one that I had noticed on my first walk through of the aisle. A stupid idea popped into my head. I reached down and grabbed it, cocking it loudly as I leveled it towards Az. Step aside, Butch, I growled. Butch shot a look at me, saw what I had, and gave me a tight grin as he lowered the Chekhov's gun and stepped out of my way. I squeezed the trigger on the super soaker and sent a stream of water directly into Az's face. His scream was piercing as smoke immediately started pouring off his melting face. I stepped towards him, continuously pumping more water as I adjusted my stream to any piece of exposed skin his squirming had left exposed. The power of Christ compels you, bitch, I yelled as I stood over him furiously pumping the squirt gun. Don't mess with retail workers. Flesh fell from the demon's bones like really good barbecued ribs, bubbling into vapor as it hit the floor. His screams became so high-pitched that I heard a few of the more delicate glass items in the shop shatter. I didn't let up on the stream of water until the plastic toy lost pressure and dribbled to a stop. As collapsed, his clothes falling into a pile on the floor as his body steamed away. I stood, panting, feeling the adrenaline burning off my skin. My shoulders, forgotten during the fight, began to throb painfully as the squirt gun slipped from my grasp. 
Did you seriously just use a Pulp Fiction line on me? I looked up at Butch in surprise and started to laugh. I mean, how often am I really going to have an opportunity like that? Just couldn't resist. He chuckled along with me. How did you know that Super Soaker would work? You made it pretty easy to figure out what he was, what with all the talk about his boss's rebellion. And I thought, with the kind of shit you have here, there was a pretty decent chance that the thing was filled with holy water. Anyway, if it wasn't, I knew you'd probably just look at me like I was an idiot and shoot him with the Chekhov's gun instead. So, you know, what the hell. He chuckled again and walked over to examine my shoulder. How's it look? I asked. I mean, you're gonna need stitches. Probably. But I don't think you're gonna bleed out anytime soon. I nodded, then glanced over at the back of the shop towards the door Jack had disappeared through. Is he gonna be alright? I asked. Jack? Yeah, he'll be fine. He's a pretty solid guy. Has friends everywhere. I'm sure someone over there will put him up until he finds his way back. His name is actually Jack? I thought I was just being clever. Nobody knows his real name. He doesn't talk much, but most people end up landing on that joke eventually. So it's kind of just something that's stuck. Ow. My self-esteem, I deadpanned. What's over there? Over where? You said someone over there will put him up. What's over there? Oh, that door leads to the back rooms. It opens up somewhere different every time, so you actually have to find another way back if you go through it. I nodded, not really understanding, but increasingly distracted by the radiating pain in my shoulder. Well, let me know next time you see him. I think I owe that guy a beer. Next question is, uh, where's the nearest hospital? He grinned. Come on, I'll patch you up. Gotten pretty good at it over the years working this job. Only lost a couple of dozen patients. I nodded and followed as he led to another door behind the cash register. He stopped with his hand on the knob. Oh, uh, remember how I was trying to figure out why you ended up finding this place? I think I figured it out. You want a job? I looked at him. I thought about the banshee and the monkey's paw and the werewolf and the demon. Then I thought about the long series of dead-end, boring jobs I'd had up till this point. You, you don't happen to have a dental plan, do you? You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead and Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. And thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Sarah SMR42, Grim Reaper, and Tomboy Top Uwu for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a special thanks to Grim Reaper, who appears to have subscribed not just on YouTube, but also on my Patreon. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you, and your support is always appreciated. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon, or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early, at 8.30 a.m., as opposed to 8.30 p.m., my time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one on your doorstep in, hopefully, a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.